It's very, very important to have assurance of faith, okay? To know that you are a child of God. That's going to enable you to live in alignment with his truth and to glorify and honor him with your life. All right, guys, like I said earlier, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, okay? And this is the topic of how can you distinguish or tell the difference between a backslidden Christian, somebody who's truly saved, but they're backslidden, they're not living their life in alignment with their profession of faith, at least to the extent that they should be, or somebody who's entirely a false convert, okay? How can you tell the difference between the two? And I want to start our study in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this in verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. We see clearly here that your profession, profession of faith in Jesus is not what gets you into heaven. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus. You coming before Jesus and saying, calling him Lord or even Lord, Lord, doesn't get you into heaven. What gets you into heaven? Well, well, it's not what gets you into heaven. I need to clarify. Your profession of faith isn't any assurance, is no assurance that you will get into heaven, is how I should put it is no assurance that you will get into heaven, okay? Because many people will profess faith on that day, and they'll say, Lord, Lord, and they won't get into heaven. So because you profess faith in Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven, okay? If your profession of faith is no assurance that you will get into heaven, instead, it is the one who does the will of the Father, who enters or gets in, according to this text. Now, what is this teaching? Is this teaching that you enter heaven through good works? At first glance, it may seem that way because your profession of faith isn't what assures you that you're going to get in, but instead, the one who does the will of the Father, they're the one who gets in. But I would like to pose a different or alternative solution. This is not saying that you get to heaven by your works. Instead, what this is saying is that you get to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ, but everyone God sees exercises true faith in Jesus Christ. God also changes their heart or their life. The answer to this question is the solution of the new birth. The new birth is the key idea here. Without the new birth, somebody doesn't get into heaven. And with the new birth that is given to somebody sovereignly by God as they repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ, they are going to now demonstrate the fruits of the new birth in their heart and life as they live. Okay? That's a key idea. The new birth resolves this question of, well, are we saying you get into heaven by works? No, of course not. We don't get into heaven by works. Instead, we get into heaven by faith and faith alone, but... God loves the one who exercises faith alone too much to let them stay in a sinful state. Instead, he takes out their heart of stone and gives them a heart of flesh, changes their life so that they will want to walk after God and follow in his commands. So it's not works, it's faith that results in works. In other words, the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven, they are demonstrating the necessary fruit of salvation. Salvation comes with the new birth, which will result in a changed heart and a changed life in the individual. Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, old things have passed away. All things have become new. Okay. We recognize that regeneration is the key idea, but now we run into a different issue. Okay. We say it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Regeneration is necessary. Amen. But here's a problem we run into. The question of sinless perfection. You're saying, okay, Tanner, you told me or taught me that I will know them by their fruits 
and that if somebody is truly saved, they're regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to change them in such a way that they're going to live in alignment with their profession. But we all know that not every Christian actually does that, okay? We know that we all struggle with sin. So how can you tell the difference? How do I know if a Christian is regenerate, but they've backslidden, or how can I tell if it's a false convert who isn't regenerate at all? Now, at, it's at this point that I want to go to 1 John 3, and I want you to hear the weight of the biblical call here, okay? 1 John 3, verses 4 to 6. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one continues to sin. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Okay? This verse 6 and 7 is very, very key. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. John is simply indicating what we have already read before, that you will know somebody by their fruits, that the fruits that they demonstrate in their life are indicators of what they believe. And that's what's being clearly demonstrated here. Now, some people take these statements as a little over the top. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. But I think that's a bad way of translating or understanding the passage. I don't think John here is teaching sinless perfection. What I instead think that John is teaching is that as a habit or lifestyle, you will not continue on in sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. You can see even the way that the NIV translators try to translate it, that they're seeming to indicate that it's a habitual lifestyle that they're walking or living in, not a one-time mistake or difficulty. So I don't think John is teaching sin sinful, excuse me, sinless perfection. Instead, I think he is teaching that as a pattern or habit of life, we will live in holiness or walk in righteousness. What's the distinguishing factor? Well, I think the distinguishing factor has to do with how the individual perceives or conceives of their sin. And I think this has to do with God's discipline. Because we've charged that either could fall into sin, and you're not going to be able to distinguish necessarily, which is the case in your life. So I think here, we need to recognize two sets of passages. Again, someone who is truly a Christian, but they're backslidden, has been born again. They have a new heart and a new spirit by God. But they're still struggling. I think Hebrews 12, 7 to 8, and Ezekiel 33 answers the question. Here's the distinguishing factor, guys. Hebrews 12, 7 to 8. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Listen to that. If you're a true child, says the author of Hebrews, you will be disciplined by God. What child is not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Okay? So discipline is a key indicator that you are a child. This is not self-discipline, like you disciplining yourself. This is instead discipline that God is enacting on your life, through which you are going through hardship and enduring and growing. So one indicator that you are likely born again or a child of God is that God is disciplining you. And I think he often does this in two ways. I think he does this through hardships and trials in our lives, just like James talks about, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let your perseverance finish, it work, finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So you see that distinguishing factor here? James tells us to rejoice when we're going through trials and difficulties because... This produces perseverance and character development in the individual. And if we meld this with Hebrews 12, we recognize that this discipline is something that God brings along. It's hardship so that we might grow because we are true children. So that's one indicator. If you look at your life and you see discipline, that's an indicator that you are a child of God. If God is disciplining you, bringing you hardship, growing you, etc. 
okay? The next aspect has to do with Ezekiel 36. Here's the next indicator, okay? If you're undergoing discipline from God, that demonstrates that you're likely regenerate, not a false convert, but backslidden. And here's the other one. This one is personal abhorrence of your sin. It says this, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. That's regeneration. We talked about that earlier. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. And then further down, listen to this. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and your detestable practices. This is a result of the regeneration, that you will loathe yourselves for your sins and your detestable practices. So self-loathing for sin is the other aspect. If God has truly regenerated a Christian and they have backslidden, they will hate every minute of their disobedience. They'll be going through it, and while they might be enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season... Deep within their heart and soul, they hate themselves. They hate their existence. They loathe themselves for the fact that they're living in wickedness and sin and iniquity that they know their Lord and Savior would not approve of. This is an indicator of the inward heart change that God has done in the Christian's life. So, practically speaking, you can tell if you're a backslidden Christian if... You have self-loathing or self-hatred towards your sin, and you see God disciplining you in your life to bring you back to him. Those are two key aspects. The vast majority of sinners who aren't regenerate will continue on in their lifestyle of sin and feel no guilt or remorse or feel bad or sorry at all for their sin, and they'll be happy to continue it. If they have any guilt, it's a self-imposed guilt. It's not a godly guilt. It's not a godly sorrow or anything like that. And ultimately, they're content to continue to live in their debauchery. That is the key idea. Now, here's one last point I'd like to make about this. Do not place your faith or hope that you're saved or that you're truly Christian in the fact that you feel guilty over your sin. Because the Bible says that there is a worldly sorrow that does not lead to repentance and salvation. Judas was guilty over his sin. Judas felt bad about what he did, but the Bible makes it clear that he wasn't guilty in a way that led to repentance and faith. He wasn't sorrowful in a way that led to salvation. And that's a key point to recognize. So I don't want you to trust or place your hope in the fact that you feel guilty, but recognize that if you're a Christian and you have fallen away and you've backslidden, you will hate your sin. And ultimately, this is one of the things that leads you to true, long-lasting repentance and obedience to God. Because you're sick and tired of going through that cycle of guilt and shame. And instead, you want to trust and follow Jesus with your life, and you're not going to emphasize or place your trust or hope in yourself, and you also don't want to continue on to sin because you hate grieving the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. That says, so guilt is how you know? Not particularly, like I said, I brought up Judas, but it's a strong indicator, okay? That's a key idea. What do disciplines look like practically? Oftentimes, this is God bringing trials, trouble, difficulty into our lives, okay? So, if you seem to have stuff going wrong, a lot of people see when stuff goes wrong in their life, and they're like, I have the, bad, I have the worst luck, or things like that. Oftentimes... God, because he loves us, brings difficulty and trials into our lives to grow our character so that we'll be more conformed, conformed to the image of Jesus. Oftentimes, he'll let unbelievers just go their own way. And they might have a successful life. They might have a, a disastrous life. But he'll let them go their own way because he's focused on bringing about certain changes in the hearts and lives of his people. Marines of Flame says, yes, we should loathe ourselves for our sin. But it's a self-loathing in reflection to who God is and who we're not. I've seen too often this narcissistic approach to either thinking that we are worthy or unworthy, void of the standard from which we actually have any comparison. We can't say we are good or evil without comparing to a standard greater than ourselves. Yes, very nice, Bereans and Flame. And ultimately, our hope and trust. What is a Christian after all? Somebody who believes in Jesus. Our hope and our trust is not in ourselves. 
not in our ability to obey or not in our inability to obey. Our hope and trust is in Jesus. And ultimately, if you look at yourself and see yourself in this light, you must come to Jesus in repentance and faith. That's what it all boils down to. Coming back to Jesus, approaching Jesus. Hey guys, Pastor Tanner here, and I firmly believe that iron sharpens iron. One of the important ways that we can all grow as Christians is to interact with one another. To that end, we have a link down below to our Twitch and our Discord where you can interact with us more in real time, either live or through that conversation. So please come join those platforms if you're interested. Take care. God bless. Bye now.